Welcome to worship at Trinity Downtown. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. We are worshiping today and praising the Lord who lived and who died and, and rose again so that we would have forgiveness, life, and salvation, an incredible inheritance. Doesn't that sound great? Today in our worship, I'm going to talk more about what that means to have such an incredible inheritance. We're continuing our sermon series, Exiles Living in Hope, looking at Peter's first letter to the Christians, to us. And I would encourage you, as we go into worship, that you would be more than just spectators, but participants in the worship service. Speak the words printed in bold type, sing the hymns, participate in the prayers, in the responses, and get out your Bible and plan to take notes and follow along with the message. So, let's go in to worship our great God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God,
The New Testament reading is from the second chapter of Acts. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We encourage you to resp uh, response uh, in the Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Glory be to, me to the Father, and to the, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, it as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Please. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. O Lord. This is the account of the late afternoon on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Luke tells us, that very day, two of the disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, 
some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels and who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. And he acted as if he was going on farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And, he won, and when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. God has made us his people through baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hey, good morning, boys and girls. It's great to be back with you. I hope you guys are having a great day. Again, we miss you. We love you. I can't wait to hear about everything that you've been doing uh, while you've been at your, at your homes. I know I'm hearing lots of things about the homework that you're doing um, and all the different uh, art projects that you're doing and maybe even the games that you're playing. Well, I brought with me today, I wanted to talk about one of the games that I love to play with my kids, and it's a game called Masterpiece, the art auction game. And here's how it works. You pretend that you are buying famous paintings, and you get some money, and the paintings have a value, but we don't know what the value is. So... One of my paintings, and for my kids too, that they absolutely love is this painting called The Circus Rider. It's one of the ones that we always fight over. We always try to, to make sure that we uh, get that in our collection. One of the paintings for me that I don't like very much is this painting called Still Life. I don't know why I don't like it, but just got a bunch of food and it just kind of looks kind of boring. But again, I don't know how much these paintings are worth. And so as you go about this game, you find that there is maybe a, a, a different value. So here's the thing. The most expensive painting in the whole game is worth a million dollars. And in this case, if I look at the back of this card, well, guess what? Still life, I don't like that painting very much. That's worth a million dollars. And one of my favorite paintings, something that I really like, Circus Rider, well, that has a word that you might not know. It's a word that says forgery. And that word basically means it's not real. It's not worth anything. Well, you know, we think about who we are called to be in Jesus. 
And Pastor Dorn is going to talk a little bit about what Peter says in his letter that he writes about being holy. And we're reminded that we're holy because of what Jesus did. Not because of some money or not because of something that's worth um, worthless. We're worth full because of what Jesus did. And so sometimes I know that even though I like this painting and I decide this is what I want to do. I want this painting. I want to do my own thing. I don't want to listen to my mom and dad right now. I don't want to do my homework. Well, that's not being holy. And that's not being who God calls us to be. You know, sometimes we're reminded that something we don't really want to do, that is what we should be doing. So you're going to probably hear Pastor Dorn talk about this word holy, to be holy, to act like Jesus. And we can only do that because Jesus has made us holy by what he did, what we just talked about a couple weeks ago, dying on the cross, and what we still celebrate right now, Easter. You know, Paul, in one of his letters, uses another word that's kind of like holy, but he uses that word masterpiece. Paul tells us through the Holy Spirit that we are God's masterpiece. We are the greatest thing that he's ever done. You are the greatest thing he's ever done. He loves you. He loved you so much that he gave his son that he loved to live, die, and rise again. I pray that you are all doing well. And again, I can't wait to see you again. Let's pray. You repeat after me at home. Dear God... Thank you for your love, and thank you for sending Jesus. We are so happy that you made us to be your masterpiece. Help us to be holy like you are holy by the strength of the Holy Spirit. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I get into the message, I want to give you just a few updates on the ministry at Trinity. First is, uh, I want to highlight the group that has been coming together each week to prepare these worship services for all of you. I am so thankful for them. And I want to especially highlight our tech team that has done a super job of preparing these worship services for you. And uh, they've done that with very uh, limited equipment and uh, resources. And we've had such positive feedback from so many of you who have been watching these videos. Our worship attendance is up by 40 to 50 percent that the feeling is we want this to be able to continue. In order for our tech team to really be able to do their job, they need to be working with better equipment uh, so that they can provide this for you. And so here's what I would ask of you. Uh, just recently, our government has given to many people across the nation, probably many of you, um, a, a blessing in the stimulus check. And I would ask you to consider a special gift from that, um, either some or all of it, designated toward our video tech ministry so that we can continue offering these great worship services to you. So please consider that. The next thing, um, on Monday, April 27th, Governor Greg Abbott will be announcing his plans for how groups will begin to gather together, together again. Obviously, we're playing, paying close attention to that because uh, we're all eager to get back to worship here at Trinity Downtown. I miss having you all here. So we're, we're watching that very, very closely, and we'll keep you posted on when we can worship here again. I also, uh, in my email to the congregation uh, this past week, 
I included an announcement that our governing board has established a call committee to fill the large shoes that are being vacated by Mr. Michael Winkler, who will be headed off in June to Concordia Seminary to study to be a pastor. Uh, we wish him well, but ministry here needs to continue. So I'm encouraged by the process because we've received a number of potential names of candidates from not only our district, but some of our Concordia universities across the country. And in this process, we also invite our members to also contribute names that they think uh, might be helpful or a potential candidate of a person who could fill the position of U Director of Youth and Children's Ministries at Trinity. So if you have a name of a person that you think might be a good candidate, please uh, give that name to me or to Matt Meyer, uh, who's the staff representative to the call committee, or to uh, Dan Kruger, the vice chairman of our congregation, who is chairing that call committee. And then finally, just one practical announcement. As you know, we've been looking at building enhancements and renovations and, and talking about uh, an upcoming capital campaign. Right now, our plans for that capital campaign are on hold, and, and we'll let you know more about that in the future. Last week, we started looking at Peter's first letter to the Christians uh, living in Asia Minor. Um, he refers to them as exiles. And the reason why he calls them that is because as believers in Jesus Christ, this world is no longer their home. They looked forward to the inheritance that Jesus uh, won for them through his death and resurrection, and that is heaven. Heaven's our home now. So just as that hope was for those folks back then, Peter's addressing us today as Christians because we share that same hope. And that term exile probably is a, takes on a whole new meaning for you during this time of isolation, uh, experiencing what it's like to be where you really don't want to be all the time. Um, and I have to say, I've gotten a real charge or kick out of some of the things I've been seeing on Facebook of, of pictures of before the time of isolation and after. For example, this one caught my attention. Um, the first day of quarantine, what we look like, to the last day of quarantine. Matt Meyer had this on his Facebook page. I happened to see it. Um, it's of the group The Beatles. And uh, he made a point to, to, for me to tell you that that was the picture 1963 is before, 1969 is after. I also saw this one on Facebook that I thought was pretty funny. And uh, I'm, I can relate to that. I don't know about you. And I hope I don't wind up, uh, you know, that I'm getting better instead of worse as these days of isolation go on. And that's, that's really the hope. And that's where Peter picks up as he looks at, uh, as he talks with the Christians who are living in exile. Listen to what he says. I'm going to pick up in chapter 1 at verse 13. He says, therefore, which is referencing the fact that Jesus has died and rose again. He's given you this wonderful inheritance. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to highlight the het phrase, gird up the loins of your mind. Have you ever said that? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Uh, I, I doubt it, and you're probably wondering, I don't even get what that means. Well, um, gird up your loins is, is probably the most accurate translation into English from the original Greek. And the folks, and this is a metaphor that Peter is using, the folks in the first century uh, who were hearing this letter would have right away understood what Peter was saying. You see, back then, everybody had long flowing robes that they wore, including soldiers. But a long flowing robe for a soldier doesn't work very well in battle. And so what soldiers would do as they prepared for battle, they would pull up that robe and tuck it into their belt so that they, their legs would be free for them to run so that they could be nimble in fighting battle. That's, that's what Peter is trying to, that's what Peter is speaking about. Now, we don't use gird up your loins today, but there are phrases that we use that are very similar to that. For example, 
roll up your sleeves. Like if you're going to really get down and do some work, and particularly work that could be dirty, greasy, or could get you wet, you roll up your sleeves and say, let's go. Or let's knuckle down and get started. Or let's get the ball rolling. You get the idea. That's what Peter is really trying to say here. Um, it, when he says, gird up your loins. And by the way, you know how to do this too. Um, for those of you who aren't tech savvy right now, you've had to gird up your loins and try to figure out how you communicate during this time of isolation through technology. And I have to say, I've really been impressed with so many of you who have, who have been able to adapt to the technology and have been able to order groceries or food from restaurants to having a visit online with your doctor to even attending a Zoom Bible study. And again, my, a shout out to our Bible study leaders. Our Bible study attendance is up and thank you all for your hard work doing that. You get the idea. And that didn't just happen overnight. It just didn't happen by you sitting in front of your computer and all of a sudden it started doing that for you. It meant you had to learn how to use the technology, learn how to use the software, trial and error, phoning a friend, asking for help, and then trial and error again, phoning your friend again to say, I'm sorry, uh, apologizing for your ignorance, saying, please help me out. <laughs> Let's try to figure this out. And God forbid, not only are you getting better at it, but God forbid if this isolation continues, you're going to be a pro at this by the time it's all said and done. That's what it means to really dive deep and get down to thinking. Um, and that's what Peter wants all of us to do. This time of isolation is really an opportunity to not deteriorate, but to become better, um, to take advantage of the opportunity that we have right now to dig into God's Word. Um, so, let's, let's go on then and take a little bit more of a look into this text. And, and this should not be viewed as a, you know, when you roll up your sleeves, get to work as a, as a, a thing of drudgery, but as something to look forward to and have fun with. Uh, just like you would with a hobby. Um, if you're excited about a hobby, that you, you, you're going to spend time learning how to do it better. That's really what, what we want to do with this. Is, this is an opportunity to spend time and to look at doing it better and have fun doing it, digging into God's Word. So roll up your sleeves, Peter says. Let's get going. Then uh, he continues, it, it, verse 14, As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And I want to highlight especially that phrase, you shall be holy, for I'm holy. Each summer, uh, our family goes up and spends a week with uh, my wife's kin um, in western Missouri on a small lake. We gather together, have all kinds of fun. All the cousins, with, along with our girls, stay at the lake house, and Valois and I get away and, and uh, uh, camp very near there in a little town called Jamesport. I think there are more horses in that town than cars. Uh, it's an Amish community. And so in the, in the mornings, I wake up to not hearing cars whiz by, but the pleasant sound of uh, horses clip-clopping past. And so I'll take my cup of coffee and sit outside the trailer and, and uh, watch the traffic, so to speak, uh, go by. And it just looks so inviting. And then when we get in the car and drive back over to the lake, I see the farmers out in the field with horses pulling plows and, and uh, family members in the, in the garden gathering sweet corn and other vegetables. And as I look at that, it's almost romantic sort of, boy, that looks like a far more relaxed and pleasant lifestyle. Now, I know that's not really true. Uh, they have their challenges as well, but... What drives the lifestyle of the Amish? It's, a, it's Bible passages like this one. Be holy as I am holy, God says. That what, what the Amish are doing is really nonconformity with the word or with the world. This also comes from Bible passages like Romans 12:2, where we say, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The Amish 
are using horse-drawn buggies, no electricity or oil lamps or zippers on their clothes or things like that because they're trying to separate themselves from the things of this world, the things that could be temptation. And while that nonconformity, certainly I, in some respects, admire it, it really misses the point of what God is saying in his word and what we as, so to speak, exiles living in this world are to be like. Our, we should rather practice an ethic of God rather than an ethic of the world and be conducting ourselves in a fashion that we don't allow the things of this world to become temptations for us. So uh, the way, what that would look like is to say, just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean you should do it. And yeah, God sees what everybody else is doing and he says, no, you shouldn't be doing that. That's how a person lives in this world. That's how we gird up our loins. That's part of girding up our loins, rolling up our sleeves, and getting to work. Being holy is something that comes out of the Old Testament, and, and, and the meaning of it is being marked off, separated, or withdrawn from ordinary use. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you're to be something different, and that should be viewed such in our world today. Let's, a little more of Peter's letter. Verse 17. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one de one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Let me highlight, conduct yourselves with fear. Fear in the Bible is oftentimes today, in our, the way we hear that word, misunderstood. The word here is conduct yourselves with fear doesn't mean we should be trembling as we go about, but rather it has the sense of because we love God so much, the God who sent his son for us, we conduct ourselves in a manner that, where we do not offend or disappoint him, but rather reverence and adore him. Um, the way this would play out would be like you would hear a child say, no, I'm not going to do that because if I do that, my dad's going to get mad. Or he'll be sad. That's an expression from a child of great love for his parents. That's how we should be conducting ourselves to say, I know what pleases the, the God that I love so dearly. So, let me continue on then a little bit further. He says, that, that we should continue this way, knowing that we are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Let me highlight that precious blood of Christ. You know, we think of silver and gold as, as precious things and, and very, very valuable but the most valuable thing to ever be on this earth was Jesus and the blood that he shed for us. And he did, just didn't shed a drop for you and me. He shed it all for us. That's why Peter refers to it as that precious blood of Jesus that takes away our sins. Um, he's referring back to uh, the Passover where people would put blood over their doorposts so that the angel of death would pass by. Just one drop was enough for that to occur, but Jesus shed all of his blood for you and for me. So, let's gird up our loins, roll up our sleeves, and find out more about what it means to have a hope in this God who would give his son's life for us. Let's read on in verse 20. He was, Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And I want to pause there for a minute and highlight love one another. It's one thing for us to roll up our sleeves and to get into God's Word and better, better understand this hope that we have. It's another thing to, he, to not only hear the Word of God, but to put it into practice. God doesn't want you to be just an expert in the Word. 
He wants you to, to live it by loving one another earnestly. And we're living in a time right now where we can do that, where people are hurting and in need of the love of God. And there are all kinds of ways that that is happening. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Our, the ladies who do our, our, our prayer quilts, so that we call them the peace-filled quilters, have switched their sewing uh, projects right now and are now making masks for people to wear. So if you're in need of a mask to wear right now, call down to the church office, speak with Stephanie, and uh, there's a limited supply of these masks, but uh, if you need one, uh, the ladies are making those masks. It's just a small way that they're showing God's love for others. Here's another one that I'll highlight. You know, our sack lunch ministry is continuing to grow right now. Uh, places where the homeless would go for food uh, is diminished, and so they're looking for, for something to eat. Um, one of our uh, volunteers for the sack lunch ministry is just buying all the, all the things they need f- to fill that sack lunch for 70, 80 lunches just out of the goodness of their heart. That's just displaying love in a different way. Peter then continues, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, he continues on and says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The word of the Lord lasts forever. So we do want to spend time in the Word. I, uh, I am thankful for all of our Bible study leaders who are, uh, who are making that possible through Zoom. I would take advantage of this opportunity while we're in this time of isolation to spend more time personally in the Word of God and to do just like you do with learning to understand technology or whatever else. If, if, if you've got to phone a friend, phone a friend. If you need to check resources, I, I don't understand this. You work to, to figure it out. Um, Take advantage of this time um, so that by the grace of God, because you're not alone in this, remember the Word of God is powerful, and that's why it has survived for over 2,000 years. The Word of God is powerful and active, and and the Holy Spirit speaks through it to you and is in you so that He can help you understand. So this week, my challenge is to, to you, how will you roll up your sleeve... To learn more about the hope that, that God has given us through Christ Jesus. And how will you roll up your sleeve to love one another earnestly? May God help and bless you in that task by His Spirit. And, the grace of, and the, may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
This time we worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And you can do that by giving online at our website, www.trinitydt.org, and click on the Giving tab, or by mailing your gift in to Trinity Lutheran Church, 800 Houston Avenue, Houston, Texas, 77007. Or you can, if you're in the area near the church, a staff member is here Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4 to receive your gift. We worship the Lord now with our gifts.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Father, your steadfast love endures forever. You know what is best for us, and in all things you are at work for our good. Grant us faith to trust the promises of your word and to roll up our sleeves to learn more about the wonderful hope that is ours through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Merciful Lord, many lives have been turned upside down right now, and there are people who are hurting and discouraged. Open our eyes to the needs of those among us that following your example, we may love one another earnestly and share from the abundance you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. prayer. Almighty King, guide and direct those who serve in our government, especially during these difficult days of uncertainty. We lift up to you our president, governors across the country, and especially the governor of Texas, that also you would be with our county judge and mayor that all our governmental leaders would do your will and serve the people as you would have them do. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Great physician, please heal the sick, strengthen the suffering, tend the injured, and hold on to the dying, especially those who have contracted the coronavirus. In these times of trial and difficulty, it's hard to see things the way you do and to trust that you are working for our good. Fill those who suffer with your peace. Strengthen them to bear the afflictions with the knowledge that Christ suffers with them. Fortify their faith that you are always good and that they are in your hands. We also ask that you would bless those in the medical field, including doctors, nurses, and researchers, with the wisdom that they need to address this pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our prayer. prayer. Ancient of days, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion will not pass away. Bring us with all the saints who have fallen asleep in Christ to that day of resurrection where we will dine with the Lamb at his marriage feast in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Our Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.